States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, we'd like to welcome Sheila back to see you. Yeah, Sheila. Uh, <laughs> you can sit up here if you want. <laughs> we have an open seat today. Yeah. 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 You can run the meeting if you want. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Rowe, do you have our legislative update? Yes, I do. Um, not much in here in this month, but um, the, uh, the Senate is currently working on the House Bill 33, which is the biennial budget bill. Um, they made some changes to the bill that passed the House. Um, but it is expected to be voted on in the Senate tomorrow. Uh, as it currently stands, which we don't know what changes may be made before it gets voted on tomorrow, but um, we expect uh, that the district will see a modest funding increase, not much, but uh, a little bit. Um, but again, that's, that's uh, pending final, uh, final approval of the bill. Uh, the only other thing that was introduced, because there's a lot of, um, as I was looking through the legislative report, there's a lot of uh, things that we've talked about in the past, you know, like the religious exemption days and, and the social studies curriculum changes and all of that stuff, but it's all in committee, so there's really not a lot new other than this piece of legislation that I named in here, uh, which is House Bill 183, um, which requires schools to allow access to male and female bathrooms in facilities in accordance with the biological sex they were assigned at birth. Um, and then the bill also requires that no persons of opposite sexes can share overnight accommodations for school sanctions. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Um, we have a student and staff recognition by Mr. Rainey. Uh, yeah, I was kind of joking earlier that this is this has grown quite a bit, and, and so I'm trying to move through it as fast as I can. Uh, but we got a lot of student achievement, so that's exciting, right? Uh, last time I highlighted tennis, so let's close out another couple sports. Obviously, we had a lot of great uh, success in track this year, but two highlights are definitely Paige and Mitch. Um, Paige, as a freshman, uh, just squeaked into state in the 100 meters and ended up 17th in the state. So very proud of her for, for getting to, to state as a freshman. Uh, incredible. Uh, Mitch, uh, that's old, old hat for him. And so he managed to make it to the state in the 1600 meter. I believe, I don't have it written down, but I think he ran a 419 mile and placed fifth in the state. So what a great cap on a great career for Mitch. So we applaud Mitch Green for all of his success over the last four years here and breaking the school record yet again. So he's got a few on the, on the board. So way to go, Mitch, uh, very proud of you. Softball and baseball had good seasons. Wanted to point out some individual awards. Uh, Lexi Smith, Southeast All District. Um, Michelle Stewart, honorable mention for first team. And then over on the baseball side, Alex Bowles, uh, first team all Ohio. Uh, so no, no real surprise there, but way to go, Alex. Uh, proud of you. Uh, Peyton Harris, a special mention, all district. LT Jordan, first team all district, but also first team all SOC and academic all district. So that was a nice uh, highlight there. And then Jace Hurd, uh, second team bowl all Ohio for second base. Uh, second team all district and second team all SOC. So congratulations to all those players on softball and baseball. Uh, congratulations to the class of 2023. A couple of special people in there for a couple of us. <laughs> it was a uh, fantastic graduation and so thanks to Mrs. Dickens and, and her team for putting that on. I thought it went very smoothly, it was uh, very nice. All the speeches were great, uh, the band, the Music, all of it was good. I might have been especially emotional though, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to congratulate all those on Fine Arts Assigning Day. I think we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, congratulations to Alex Ward, Harrison Hinshaw, John Bashball, Olivia Dickens, uh, Hannah Ramey, Maddox Bach, and Thomas Knoll. 
Uh, you see uh, John Fashball uh, pictured there with uh, Zach and Megan Smith. Most of these were uh, visual arts, but then Thomas Knoll was for creative writing. Uh, so Mrs. Dixon was up there with him. So well done, all those uh, who signed for fine arts scholarships and programs. Uh, several band highlights. One of them is they had a great trip to Lake Erie. Uh, Mr. Ross says they represented Waverly very well in their performance at Cedar Point and got to take a few other trips. So it sounds like it was a, a fantastic trip. Uh, another field trip that uh, some band kids got to take, those in Zach's, uh, Mr. Ross's, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, music history class uh, got to go down to Cincinnati to watch their symphony orchestra perform Mozart's Requiem Mass, which they studied earlier in the year in class. And so for many students, this was the first time seeing an orchestra perform live. And so they thoroughly enjoyed themselves. Uh, so very neat opportunity for our students. Also wanted to highlight, we do this, I know I did this last year too, but always a, a source of pride to see our, our Waverly Memorial celebration led by our high school band uh, down the, I, I don't even call it a parade, it's a joint walk to the <laughs> <laughs> uh, But then them leading in that service there was, uh, was fantastic. Uh, many of you probably got to be there at Evergreen and, and watch it. Uh, if you remember last year, I told you the, the good news of Abby Booker getting accepted to the All-American D-Day Band. Uh, this was an incredible opportunity, incredible trip for her, and then Mr. Ross and a couple others went with her. Um, he says the, the band was conducted by uh, former director of the United States Army Band, uh, Colonel Timothy Holton. The trip started in D.C., where they rehearsed and uh, performance at the World War II Memorial. Uh, they went to France, uh, visited several D-Day sites, and included performances in the village of saint mary Glise which is the first town to be liberated by the Americans. And that's the little video you have here of their parade. So this is Abby right here. So Mr. Ross said it was uh, just a really neat experience because there in that little village, they um, wave American flags, they dress up in American military uniforms. And for a Waverly student to be a part of that, I think is just really, really cool to be. They had other stops and they had a, had a great time. So uh, congratulations to Abby. Uh, some volunteer work uh, that uh, Mrs. Prawl wanted to highlight and thank uh, Caitlin Dykecott, Kyle Rhodes, and Tom Justice. So, voluntarily, not through a program, not for extra credit, uh, but went and worked on the primary uh, flower beds, the, the landscaping. So thank you to, to each of those students. Uh, I wanted to highlight Dakota Sparks, a high school history teacher, uh, for having perfect attendance. We always talk about student perfect attendance, but Mr. Hoover wanted to highlight teacher perfect attendance. So congratulations to, to Mr. Sparks for having perfect attendance this year. We also certainly want to uh, congratulate uh, the retirements that we had. We had several of them. Uh, Mrs. Buchanan, Mr. Martin, Mrs. Toombs, Hank Lewis, uh, and then Mrs. Uh, Sharon Lewis down there at the bottom was a junior high party, that they uh, retirement party that they threw for her. Uh, Mrs. Sheraton and Mr. Green. Uh, we had Mr. Green in seventh grade, didn't we? I forget how old he is sometimes. And did you have Mr. Green? <laughs> I hope he hears oh, I that. Teddy. I had Teddy Bruce. <laughs> so if I did my math correctly, that is 210 years of service that we're celebrating this year in retirement. So thank you to all of those uh, retiring. Uh, Ann and I got to visit the seventh grade and watch their uh, Kentucky Derby project. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. All those kids had some part in the presentation. And then even a lot of you saw on Facebook the picture of the horse that they decorated. I don't know if that's the right word. <laughs> uh, but they, they did arts projects, they did English projects, they had math portions to this. And it was a really a great example of, of I guess, like cross-discipline learning. Uh, really what we're kind of talking about when we talk about STEM stuff. It's really just cross-discipline uh, projects. So a, a great example of a, of a learning project that these seventh graders, these gifted students, uh, certainly got into and did a great job on. Uh, Mrs. Brawl also wanted to highlight at the end of their year here, the Tiger by the Tail 4-H Club. And so here's a few photos from the year. Uh, they recently took a field trip to Bristol Village Activity Center, as many of their projects were related. They work with a lot of mentors, both from Bristol and around our community. On May 18th, they participated in a uh, project judging at the school. 
And so uh, they had uh, several high school students, uh, Izzy Houck, Landon Williams, Mackenzie Wiseman, and Kalia Burdett, uh, all helped judge that. And all, they had 23 students complete their projects. Uh, and those students were encouraged to participate at the county level judging this summer where they could qualify for the state fair. Um, so that is something happening after school, but it's a great opportunity for our students to be in, involved in uh, both community service and other type of projects. Uh, Mr. Robertson said, sent what I guess could be his last set of slides for the intermediate school. Uh, fifth, uh, fifth grade career day, I was hoping he was gonna be here to describe some of these different things, but uh, they got a chance to uh, uh, at least hear about a few career options. Uh, highlight of a fifth grade band concert. You see, I love how well attended this is. Look at that, look at that crowd. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was wonderful. Fifth grade also got to take a field trip, the same place that the uh, fourth graders did, the Family Traditions Animal uh, Petting Zoo. Uh, the attendance reward, they got to go uh, see a movie uh, for, uh, for good attendance. And then we've been talking about the Accelerated Reader contest all year and those that got to 100 points got to go to a skating party so you see a fantastic group there uh, that achieved a, a very big mile, milestone in, in AR. Uh, they had an end of the year award celebration uh, as did the, the junior high. Uh, they had a fourth nine weeks uh, positive behavior reward party. It looks like a lot of fun. Uh, anybody ever tried that writing bowl? I, I've always wanted to try that. Uh, and then they also had a, a guest speaker who I guess is a local author. Does anybody know more about Wes Molabash? Uh, I wanted to hear uh, a little bit more about I guess he's got a book coming up and he, he got to talk to the students. Uh, so a little different side of, of literacy and not just the, uh, the reading portion, but he got to talk a little bit about the writing side of it. So I think that was a, a neat opportunity for our students. Uh, they also had a great field day and cookout at the intermediate. I'm sure it was a great competition. Uh, and then we had a couple of, on the state test, a couple of uh, noteworthy results. Uh, fourth grade perfect score on math with Emory Pendleton and Jackson Hubbard, so congratulations to both of them. And in the fifth grade uh, ELA state assessment, uh, Mia Portillo had a perfect score in that, so congratulations to all three of those students, quite, quite the accomplishment. Over in the primary school, we've got our uh, monthly Tigers of the Week. You see the, the kindergartners uh, pictured there representing teamwork, integrity, grit, excellence, and respect. Uh, there's our first graders, and then finally the last set of second graders as they say goodbye to the primary school. Uh, also wanted to highlight a Tiny Tiger STEM Day. Uh, these pictures are from uh, Mrs. Pollard's class, and she writes, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Mr. Daniel Sand, all of his high school students, and Ms. Turner for our fun and exciting hands-on STEM day in kindergarten. Mr. Stan, Sand and his students came over to the primary, and I heard there were like 50 high school mm -hmm. students involved in this. Is they that did correct? an awesome job, yeah. Uh, that's incredible. They made ice cream in a bag and slime with the students in all seven of the kindergarten classrooms. Uh, they were so engaged, and uh, Becky writes, I love hearing their questioning on how and why changes were occurring. Uh, the high schoolers were phenomenal and so sweet with our students. They even joined them at recess and played with them. So a uh, great example of both learning but also making a connection uh, there socially. So a wonderful thing for sure. All year long we've been celebrating uh, early literacy and how great of a job they've been doing in the primary school. Uh, you see uh, literacy, I believe it was literacy luau, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, looks like a lot of fun, a lot of uh, things going on, uh, great activities. I see a couple board members in this picture here. Uh, so it looks like a, a fantastic night uh, that a lot of staff joined in on and a lot of students participated in. Anything you'd like to add? Um, it, it was the first time we've been able to have one in a couple of years. So oh, wow. It was, yeah. it was great COVID, turnout. Yeah. People were super excited. We even had um, representatives from the li public library who were there. We had information stations. Um, each of our grade level teachers had some different things set up where families could go. and. I didn't put a picture on there. Um, once they kind of made their rounds with their punch cards, they could turn those in for a gift card. Nice. And we had a couple of little set brothers who had won that. And Excellent. It's fun night. Yeah. Excellent. Sounds like a, a fantastic evening. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Turner also sent some more data, some end of the year stuff. You see some uh, spring diagnos diagnostics here in iReady, um, Orton Gillingham, and then uh, behavior, PBIS stuff. And it's just so fun to look at that growth, isn't it? I mean, it, on the iReady, you move from 
uh, 57% on track to 96% in kindergarten. Uh, on the OG assessment, you move from 12% in, in tier one uh, to 96%. So that, man, great, fantastic results. And first and second grade were very similar as well. Uh, some very positive data that we see there of, of students definitely growing in early literacy. Uh, but I didn't want to just leave it at data, I wanted to give you an example of it, and Ms. Babst um, sent me a video, uh, which is a super cute video, I was tearing up throughout it, um, of her class reading Buzzy the Bumblebee. Uh, it's an interesting story because it's about a bumblebee that's told bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly. And so even as I'm listening to these kids read, I think a lot of times, especially our disadvantaged students, are told, hey, you shouldn't be able to read this well this early, and they believe it. And, and it's so nice to see them overcome this. Uh, this is an 11-minute video, but I'm not going to indulge me in three minutes of the end, uh, and I'll make the link available to any of you that would like to see it. But um, we pick up the story where uh, Buzzy is confronting his parents about, hey, you never told me that bumblebees weren't supposed to be able to fly. So just listen to these kids read and think about the data and the success we've had in early literacy this year. Can you open with a tear in his eye? Mom and Dad, why didn't you tell me bumblebees weren't mad, made to fly. Why, Buzzy, they said, you certainly can fly until now. That is it. And do you know why? Like I said, this is just an example. She had the whole class read apart. It's about an 11 minute book, but it is worth every second of it, in my opinion. I kind of wanted to read what she said too, just to close. Uh, she said in this read aloud, you'll notice uh, students reading fluently. You'll see students using the phonics they've learned to blend and read words. Uh, you'll see students self-correct. You'll see mistakes. You will hear robot reading. Uh, you'll witness so many different reading levels. You will see students who have overcome so many challenges, who have overcome labels and limits you will see first graders reading. This video includes all of my students. What you will not see is students reciting pages that they've memorized. This is 100% authentic first grade reading. What happens at the primary is vital to the success and future of our district. We are the educational foundation. We are the beginning of Tiger Pride. We are where the love of learning starts. It is so much more than just letters and sounds. And so please join me in celebrating the victories of our primary building. I'm incredibly proud of these kids, and I hope you can see the pride on their faces as they show off what they've accomplished this year. And so, yes, we agree with uh, Ms. Babst that we're so proud of these kids, and we're so proud of what you guys have done with the primary this year uh, in early literacy, and I know that that, uh, is, that legacy is going to continue into the future, uh, because it does lay a foundation not just for years to come, but for decades to come. So thank you to uh, all those teachers who have worked so hard this year in that. Thank you, Mr. Ramey. Uh, we will proceed with our general discussion uh, with possible approval. And 
uh, the first item there, Jackie. Yeah, sure. so the Ohio Coalition for Equity and Adequacy is, a, is an organization that we apply, that we're a member of, we've been a member for several years. This is the organization that brought the Dural lawsuit um, that determined that, um, that our school funding system was So our membership dues um, are, they are at 50 cents per student, um, so I would just ask you to renew the membership for that. So moved. Okay, second. Okay. Mr. Hobbs? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Rainey? Yes. Mrs. Egg? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we didn't have any there on approval of camps and activities. Right, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, we didn't. He approved all the ones last month. So the next thing would be our workers' compensation group rating program. We participate through um, Shapely Uniservices, the company we do. It's basically like a consortium for your workers' compensation premium. Um, and we have, this will be our second year with Shapely. There's another group, comp management. Usually we go back and forth between the two, whichever one gives us the better deal of this year. Um, it will be shapely. We're anticipating for um, our group premium for workers' comp to be around twenty-five and a half thousand dollars. For this is for calendar year twenty twenty-four. Um, it's a savings of about thirty-four percent, and the fee is going to cost us. I believe this is going to be eight hundred dollars. Mr. Uh, Mrs. Edgar? Yes. Mr. Ramey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. All right. Summer school staff. We talked to you about summer school last at the last meeting um, about how we do the extended summer learning at the primary building and intermediate um, for grade K through six. Is that correct? Actually, I think we might have one seventh grade. Okay. Yeah, I think we opened it up to everybody. Um, we do have, sorry, let me pass this around. This is a list of the staff who will be, who is working extended summer learning. Um, you'll notice we do have a couple substitute teachers listed on here once you see the list. It was offered <coughs> to all of our regular teachers, um, but we just, yeah, we didn't have enough to sign up, so we, we did offer it then to our some of our regular subs. So we do have, um, I believe, Andrea Moore and Jessa Evans are the two substitute teachers who are on there. Maggie. 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 Oh, yeah, Maggie. Forgot she's always here. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, a bit tough. Um, so the um, wage for that is $32 an hour for the teachers and $22 an hour for the aide. Kim Wilson is the aide working. And that is paid through the um, ESSER grant, which is the COVID relief. So I would ask for approval of those names and, and the rates. So moved. Mr. Hobbs? Yes. Mrs. Zerger? Yes. Mr. Ramey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. All right. And then we would like to um, set a day and time for a special meeting for um, the end of June for a couple different things. Um, one, to approve the fiscal year and financial data and then um, we think we'll probably need to do some employment of staff just with with the with the movement of, of things so I was kind of looking Bill and I will both be on vacation next week we'll both be out of the office yes me too yes, we're always on yeah. <laughs> So we have, like, uh, that last week in June, um, does that work for you guys? Is there a kind of date there? We have to have it for July 1. Yep. Yes. Just keep in mind we have it in the Archer that week, too. Not that that means not that we can't have any evening lunch. Yeah. Is that Monday through Thursday? Tuesday through Friday. Tuesday through Friday? Mm -hmm. Do you want to put Sunday, then? I mean, I'm fine any day. Whatever. We're going to be back for evening, but I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm, I'm out that whole week. Okay. 
you're saying the 20, the week starting the 26th? Yes. Right? yes. Yeah, not that whole week. But you can argue with that. Does anyone else have any um, days you can't do that week? No, I mean, so I think summer league basketball is that over? That you only do the first three weeks of June, Bill. I think there might be some that last week on Monday night. Maybe I don't know. Maybe that's girls. No, I think Monday and Wednesday. Yes, yeah, so we do Tuesdays and Thursdays right now. Junior high, high school, then swim in the morning. So, I mean, if it's mon if they do it Monday, just need to be a little later than we would normally meet on Monday because Monday is usually a busy day out of work. So it might be like a five thirty or something like that, or a six. But if you're your mom's okay. talking shorthand. Yeah, it should be a long yeah. day. Okay, yeah. Do you want to look, well, we could look at Wednesday then if you want. I mean, we could stick with Wednesday or? Is that right? That's fine. Yeah. The 28th? Yeah, that's fine. Wednesday yeah. the 28th, what time? I can do any time, really. Okay. Five. Five? Five thirty, whatever you have to Okay, so June 28th at 5 p.m.? The next item there is uh, approval of paving estimate. And uh, we have, as you noticed when you came in, I think I messaged, I know I messaged Alan, but uh, maybe I, I can't remember if I messaged you guys or not, but the islands, uh, we, we have stripped the, the tops a lot of those and we're putting limestone in there, Kindle cases, limestone in that. Uh, that is a uh, maintenance project that we needed to do before we ever do any paving again obviously so we don't mess up new paving uh, so uh, we're going to do that uh, we think that will save us considerable time as far as our mowing and our resources and weeding and things like that plus it'll look nicer so uh, that's something we've been wanting to do so uh, Kendall said they would probably put the stone down I think they're scheduling to do that probably early next week like on Monday so right now you just see the felt there but that's to help us with preventing weeds and stuff coming through so we're doing that, but uh, we have a couple estimates here on the paving, and this is on repairs. Um, we went through and, and identified about a dozen, 12 or 13 areas that really need to be uh, repaired before we do any paving. So uh, we have two estimates there, uh, G and J and uh, Jerry Gillen Construction. Um, G and J has done work for us before. Um, I would recommend them because um, the work we've had them do before, they recognize the importance of the base under the paving, and the areas that they're going to be repairing are the ones that are are sinking or, or cracking and, and uh, falling in. And so, um, you know, uh, and I'd be glad to show you. I've got a map that I can show you all the areas, but you can you can tell when you're driving. That we have plenty of areas there that we need to repair. Um, and the, uh, the thoughts are for this process would be that we would do these repairs and then allow uh, some, some time, maybe six months or a, to a year, uh, to make sure that it, it's, it's not settling any more than it should be, uh, that it's proper before we, we go ahead and proceed in with more uh, repairs. So, it's pretty warm, it's pretty good. Yeah. so that's kind of the, the uh, game plan or strategy that we were looking at for that repair. But we wanted you to take a look at those two uh, quotes and, uh, you know, ask for approval on, on the estimate. Yeah, so uh, I, I can tell you that G&J has done, uh, they did our, our parking lot downtown at Rediger Field, uh, and we really haven't had any problems with that. Um, they've done curbs for us before, um, so, I mean, we, we do have... Uh, history of having dependability with them on, on their work. But so are you thinking it's beneficial to do this in basically segments of repairing versus just repaving everything? Well, no, I think I think th these these repairs are basically because we have spots that are sinking. Yeah. And uh, uh, Chad Jordan that walked the campus with me to look at it, uh, he felt like that we needed to make those repairs. He, he recommended making those repairs first and then we come back and pave and we can look at okay. doing everything. So, uh, you know, that, that'll be up to the board's discretion how we want to do that or, you know, we, we can look at that process in parts or we can look at it in, in one time. So uh, 
Um, you know, obviously we'll be gathering quotes uh, on that. Um, I think three or four years ago we had a quote on the, the paving part, uh, resurfacing. Uh, it was it was over a million dollars uh, to do all that. So um, you know man, that's not getting any cheaper. So yeah. So but, do we have and permanent improvement, Becky? Do we have that for that negotiation that settlement? Yeah, it okay. is. It's part of the uh, three million dollars. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would also like in <laughs> next year whenever we consider doing that, maybe as a package deal with downtown to especially as you, as you go towards the locker room and stuff that's just chewed up really bad downtown yeah and you know i don't know probably have to chip that off again and re repair but that's not been paved since probably the 80s no uh, that i'm aware of patrick yeah. you remember anything that's not been paved since you know it's not been paved since i've been you know it's still in decent shape you know there's does not hold up on the parking area but yeah. as you go up the hill there, it's, it's pretty rough it's pretty yeah. rough yeah. Yeah. so we've patched holes there every year the last five years i mean yeah i mean it'd be nice to see what potholes. what that would cost you know, it'd be nice to see what that okay. would cost to tie that in. I mean, there would probably no sense in doing anything like that right now. We're going to do construction up there with, right. the, with the building. But okay. Once that's done. Okay. Okay. So we would. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Proceed with that. Second. Okay. Mr. Hoff. Yes. Mr. Ruff. Yes. Mr. Dyer. Yes. Mr. Rainey. Yes. Okay. We also are having some power washing going on with our sidewalks this summer and concrete uh, we just started with the high school last year and uh, it was the first time that we've done that extensively and it needs it uh, so uh, we're going to be doing that trying to get that done too as well before we start our resealing process so all of that's in line and we're not flushing you know that onto the new pavement so all right Thank you. Okay. So next up we have our renewal of our property fleet and liability insurance. Um, it's kind of a little, this table is from the insurance agent, it's a little chaotic. Um, but once you get it, the first column is this 2223, so that's what we have paid this year. Um, we um, increased our so there's a price increase for the property insurance. That's the bulk of, of what this insurance quote is. Do I not do this? Oh, yeah. Okay. So Wright Specialty and Liberty Mutual <coughs> both gave us a quote for the property insurance. And so you can see from the second column over the Wright Specialty property insurance was 50908 was the premium. And the Liberty Mutual was 53241. Um, Wright Specialty is the only company that quoted on our, our fleet, which is our bus and our auto policy and the liability. So what is being recommended then is the Wright Specialty premium. If you look at the second page, you can see the grand total for each column. Um, so you can see it is a, um, a pretty big increase over last year. We did have two companies who declined to quote us. That was the Ohio School Plan and the <coughs> SORSA, which is a consortium of school districts, <coughs> to also offer insurance. What was the reasoning for declining? Uh, I am not sure. The agent didn't say. Um, I would like to next year put it out um, to more bids so that we can get a quote. I think, I think we're with a con an agent called School Insurance Consultants, and they, I think the other companies don't like to quote with them, I'm not sure why. So I'd like to explore other options next year. Well, who's right, right specialty? Right specialty, that's, that's an insurance company. It's yeah. located. Oh, well, who knows where they're located? Oh. Probably, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, but it's not local. Did we ask to increase our deductible or did they increase it as far as the I, I believe they increased it as far as the quote. I, I mean, I'm going through this at work right now and it, it's insurance is going up like crazy. Oh, yeah. 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 The deductibles are yeah. being increased across right. the board. Health yeah. insurance and everything. Yeah. So um, I would ask for your approval to renew with Wright Specialty 
at a cost of $91,071. Second. Mr. Hobbs? Yes. Mr. Rainey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Mrs. Zoyer? Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you, Becky. Uh, uh, we have had some discussion about like our numbers with our intervention and uh, K through 12 and talking about support with our staff and that's a frequent conversation we have when we're looking at our staff and, uh, and in, in the midst of that conversations uh, I thought that in looking at the changes I thought it would be good right now for Mrs. Stolle to present you a brief presentation about how that's changed just in the most recent time when uh, maybe Mike Roback was in that role so uh, if we could give Mrs. Stolle a couple minutes here to present that to you. Sure. Um, so, you know, I'm finishing up my fourth year, which I can't even believe it. It's like a blur. <laughs> I was high school principal, but I've been doing this for four years. And um, in my four years, I've definitely seen a shift of our student population. Um, but I found some information that Mr. Roebuck had. And, um, you know, we noticed those changes pre-pandemic. But honestly, but then you throw COVID-19 in and it, these last three years have just really just, you know, I think everyone's just kind of changed and uh, the needs of students academically and behavior, behaviorally have, you know, increased significantly. And uh, I found some data from 2016-17 and compared it with our numbers for this year and I, we, we discussed it like Bill said at an administrative meeting and I thought it was something to kind of share and show that some of the decisions you have allowed us to may, make and do is definitely, it's gonna show you the need for sure. Um, in 2016-17, we served approximately 150 students in our district in special education. Uh, this year, just looking at students that have, have qualified for IEP, I did not include 504 plan, students that are solely on a behavior plan, or um, students we consider at risk, which we have all of those things too. We serve approximately 250 kids. So, you know, 100 students, that, that's, that's quite, a, quite an increase. Um, this year we completed 69 reevaluations, which those you do every three years, and then 37 initial evaluations for a total of 106 evaluations that were completed this year. We did meet 100% of our timelines, which is important when it comes to auditing. We're, we're, we're doing everything the way that the state says, so that's good. Uh, but we did notice that our disability categories, they're, they're shifting. Um, we have seen a rise in autism, uh, other health impairment, which can include students with ADHD or you know, other, other health impairments, and then uh, even the emotional disturbance category where kids that they have those behavioral needs that is you know, affecting their learning. Uh, we have talked about providing professional development. We have provided professional development to our general ed staff because they, you know, they have kids in their rooms that they, you know, need some assistance with and how, how to deal with, with things that maybe they haven't had to deal with, you know, even five years ago. Uh, you know, that's why it is so important to concentrate on early intervention, which, uh, you know, I appreciate the board's effort, the district's effort, you know, we've added in the past few years, we added the behavior specialist position, we added the MD unit at the junior high, um, and we've added some intervention positions at the lower level to try to target that, you know, early intervention. Uh, they'll be providing tier two and tier three students on those needy, they'll be able to provide that support there. And then again, like I said before, we're looking at the primary of, of how can we make sure our tier one instruction is including all those things too, because Again, we have more and more students with those needs. Uh, so more and more students are beginning school already behind, as we, as we can see and look at the data. And as a district, we're brainstorming ways to combat, combat this. Our district goals are aligned to address these issues and we'll continue to work with staff and students to make needs. And um, I thought I would print and give you a copy of our special ed education profile. You know, we've talked a little bit about a few of these things before, but I don't know that you've seen this, this document completely. This is the 22-23 uh, profile. It does look at data from 21-22, so it's looking at last school year's data. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through it, you know, section by section, everything, but I am gonna highlight some things for you. Um, so if you look at page one, 
The first essential question is, are young children with disabilities entering kindergarten ready to learn? So if you look at that page, you can see the top section, that, that the, the six A, B, and C, that deals with, um, do we have our preschool kids in the settings that they're appropriate for? And, and we do, we, we met all those. So then if you look in that middle section, that's where it looks at our preschoolers, they take, they take almost like a pretest. The teachers do like a survey of kids, what they can do at the beginning individually, and then they do that at the end of the year too. So that's where they're getting these scores. Um, and any preschool student, not just our public preschool, but our kids that go to Head Start, they, they do this too, our kids that are in ESC preschool. Um, and you can see that we, you know, it's something that we still continue to have to try to work with because if you look, our preschoolers are showing they still need, have needs in social emotional um, knowledge, which is you know, some of the academics, and then those appropriate behaviors. Now, it's a great thing they're in preschool because I think it would even be more difficult in kindergarten if we didn't have those kids there. But um, you know, our little guys, they have a long way to grow when, when they're coming to us. So um, that is something that, that you know, as, a, as a district we're focusing on. Uh, question two asks, are children with disabilities achieving at high levels? So if you turn the page, you can, you can um, look there. The top part deals with participation rates. So we kind of get a check that our students with disabilities are participating in these tests. And if you look, we, we, met, we met all those categories. At the bottom, they then look at fourth grade, eighth grade, and then high school. Um, and this is where I said it's, it's aligned right to our district plan, if you see this. We need uh, to target, you know, eighth grade high school when it comes to, to math, and that, so that's the that's same as general education as it is with our special education students. So, and I know we're, we're, all, we're all working on that. Um, we, we did meet those categories in fourth grade. If you look on the next page, um, and this, this top part is a little deceiving because the top one, two, three, four, five, the top six box up there, um, I think we had nine kids take the alternate assessment. So kids that are not taking the regular assessment that everybody else takes, uh, it used to be a lot greater than that, but the state has really, they want all kids testing the same way. Um, so those indicators are really talking about nine kids. So if you think about that, if you just have a couple that don't meet it, it's gonna you know, pull that number down. Um, we are, we're hoping to get a new curriculum for our MD units. Uh, called Teach Town that, that I hope that will really, that can maybe help us with that, that it's more, more aligned to the, to the testing requirements because the, those are our most needy kids. Uh, but then if you look down the bottom, and this is what I'll say is, I think what I'm most proud of on this report is if you look at the indicators for grade four, grade eight, and high school, in math and ELA, we met all those for the gap, which means our special education population is meeting the target compared to our general ed. So in other words, our, our special ed education population is, is doing relatively the same as our general ed. So I, I, think that's, I think that's good. Um, the next question, to what extent do students with disabilities have access to the general education require, requirement? Uh, you know, our, our plan is to always have a student in their least restrictive environment. Uh, when you add 100 kids, kind of in eight years, that's where you see the need of, of we're kind of growing out of the buildings here where we've had to add a unit and do some different things. But if you look there, we did meet all those except for the last one, which is um, the number of students we have in a separate facility. And you know, the thing is, like I said, we place kids where we think they need to be placed, where they learn best. There could be some years where we probably have a couple more kids that need to go to like the early childhood center or places like that and not be, you know, not be here. Uh, the last two sections talk about uh, are we preparing kids for life, work, and post-secondary, and that's where we've talked about before where Lorna McClay came and spoke about graduation, and dropout rate, and transition. You know, our intervention specialists at the higher levels really concentrate on that and try to try to meet the needs of kids. Our coat co co uh, people definitely help with that too. And then last, the last sections talk about um, does the district implement idea to improve services and then um, about 
are we equitable in providing things and we you know we met those categories. So if you if you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer. But like I said, I do appreciate kind of the direction we're going and the and the help you're allowing us to get here. But um, I could talk to you anytime. I'll try to answer. Thank you, Mrs. Stone. Yeah. Quick question, you okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, indicator 14 on page four. There's the post school outcomes. How do, how do they gauge that? Will we know that in the coming years? Hold, or? hold on one second. So, show me, tell me again where you are. Indicator 14 on page number four. Under a central question four. Are youth with disabilities prepared for life work and post secondary education? Are youth with, okay, where it says post school outcomes? Yes, correct. Okay, so that's, and I imagine that's, that's a years new, to come. Yes, so that's it's a, it's a new that's, metric altogether? Yes, it's, okay. it, that is where. Um, Kim, that's what our English person is entering in and has been calling all of our graduates from last year and okay. finding out what, what are you doing? Are you in school? Are you working? Are you in college? I'm very intrigued by that data point. Yes. That would yeah. be so that, that's, very, a, that's very a new nice thing. So we didn't have the data. Or I think it'll data. be on next like next year's report. We would have that information. Yeah, I think that was new this year. So it used to be that we surveyed just a certain number of kids and um, we had to send things out and we sent to the state kind of, and they've revamped that whole, whole system. So, any more questions? Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Ashley. All right. Uh, we have a uh, school health report. Uh, Becky. I wanted to share this with you. Uh, we met with an, our two school nurses, um, Kelly uh, Foggs and, and Whitney Hensley. Met with them uh, before we finished school, and uh, well, at the end of the school year, the last day in service. And they provided this information. This is like their annual report, health report. And basically, I wanted you to have this because this gives you an idea of the frequency and the number of students that we're serving and the various services that we're providing uh, with our, our, our uh, health and wellness. And I do want you to know that we are uh, continuing to look at uh, improving that uh, with our, our agreement with Adina. They'll, they'll have a, a, a wellness unit that will be coming uh, next year to the school from time to time. Uh, Kelly Boggs told me that she's also uh, Got another uh, avenue. She had uh, a, a group reach out that has a, a dentistry through a van that they provide free dentistry for students in, in need, and uh, she's she's going to respond to them to see uh, you know anytime we can find more support for our students and uh, in their health and safety, we, you know we'll, we'll look for that. So I just wanted you to have that. Um, they are our nurses are quite busy, and you know we have two on campus. So they, they log the steps uh, every day. Um, and we, we discussed in our meeting at the end of the year when they provided this to me, we talked about uh, how, how we can be more efficient uh, to continue to improve our services for our students. And uh, one of the things they talked about was possibly like having uh, blocks at each building. Now understand, a nurse, we can, we can set a block, but there, there comes a time when they're called that they have to respond. So. Um, and they have some students that, that require them every day for, for different things. Uh, we have some students that are diabetic and, and, and other situations like that. So I just wanted you to know uh, when they provided this to me, I thought it would be interesting to give to you to show you that, uh, what we are utilizing with our, with our nurses and, and that program. So, Do yeah. we, uh, when new students come in, I mean, now it says new students. But I mean, you know, new students in the middle of the year or the fourth week of school, or yeah. do we check these things with them when they, uh, you know, not yeah. new, new, but transfer yeah. and all that? Do yeah. they get this, like, this screening um, also? We, yeah, they, they'll be in there. We have to check, uh, obviously, obviously there's vaccinations and things like that that they have to have, and the nurses are, are, mm -hmm. are part of their role is to make sure that they're updating the list and checking to make sure the students have the appropriate vaccinations that they're required. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I, I can't speak specifically as to how we do that. I assume there's a communication with our, 
our yeah. office staff to the nurse. Yeah, from enrollment, yeah. like when they enroll with Mrs. Leffler, you know, there's a checklist of things that they have to provide that they have had, per, you yeah. know, submitted all of those forms and things Just, like that. Uh, you and know, and I kind of, you know, the kids that transfer, kids that come in, if they are screened in, you know, with these things, uh, especially the hearing and eyesight, I wonder if they well, it, it's day. like the state guidelines that have to happen like at the beginning of the year, like they would have had that in the school that they mm -hmm. came from for our little kids. Hopefully. You know, that would have been, it yeah, it has to be done by a certain date, and then when they transfer or re enroll in another district, that follows them. I thought it was interesting 220 were screened and needed to see an eye specialist. Yeah. Of course, I know that that's K through 11, but still, you know. Yeah, and, and uh, how many, you know, and there's probably many more students, but uh, sure. we're trying to provide the best that we can and try to have a net that's as I know effective as possible to catch them, so. Yeah. But that's how we found out my daughter needed eye glasses was her kindergarten screening. Oh. Yeah, we didn't know. Then we found out she couldn't see. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm thankful for it. Yeah. What I'm amazed by in this report, though, is when I think back to the last few years, how much COVID-19 tracing they did, and then you see all of the services that they were inviting otherwise. It's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's, true. it's amazing yeah. that they got it done. It's the kudos to them. So, yeah. so, but just wanted you to have that. Thank Again, you. Just like with Mrs. Stolle's presentation, wanted yeah. you to be aware of, of things there with the school. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Next, we have the uh, consent agenda, and we have some contracts that we wanted you to look at. Uh, we have, Becky, we got the uh, Jefferson County ESC Virtual Learning Academy. Right, so we have used the VLA program for the last several years, um, and we would like to renew that for the 23-24 school year. The charge is a $1,500 fee, and then we pay, depending on which students use it, we pay a, a course fee and a student fee. So What's like, that? Is that like, what we call WAVE? Yes, yes. That's okay, that was my question. Yeah, yeah that's wave. So we, we utilize that for credit recovery, uh, like even in our summer school, we utilize that for students that have to recover credit. Um, you know, a lot of students that, you know, we talked about when Lorna came in and told you about, uh, we have students at risk, and uh, you could go in there in the office and look at Brack's board in the office about, we had a list of students who were uh, in jeopardy as far as graduating in the last year. Uh, so, you know, uh, we utilize that program to, to try to help. Uh, sometimes we have students that'll transfer in and they'll be credit deficient, and they might even be an uh, underclassman that wants to go to the CTC the next year, and if they're credit deficient, that hurts their chances of getting in. So even at that level, we utilize that. So, um, and you know, also it's, it, we can use it to supplement uh, the, uh, the curriculum. Now, when, when we uh, direct uh, parents and students with this, uh, we, we always direct that this is, we do not feel that this replaces being in a classroom with a teacher in a normal environment or what we call a normal environment. So, uh, but uh, it does provide us an alternative opposed to not, for that student not to have an option. So, um, you know, uh, there's also in, in like home instruction situations or a situation where a student maybe uh, would have a health issue, uh, we could utilize this as well. So it, it just gives us some options there as far as uh, trying to help the students earn credit. Do you have any idea how many people are using it? How many students do you have in it? Uh, no, but I, I can get you that information. I think it was when they're around like in between 50 and 60. Yeah. I, I can, I can yeah, get I you the information. It's 50. And it might even be a little more than that, like maybe a, a, like a credit recovery situation, or maybe in and out, like where they right. finish. So we have kids who move in and out yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Or only take a course. Or if they're yeah. Yeah. not. Right. Semester. So are we doing this all at once? Or? No, we'll do the consent agenda all at once. And then we've got uh, what? the Ross Pike ESC agreement. Okay. Again, this is a renewal for, um, for next school year. The agreement with Ross Pike, it includes our speech therapy, special ed units, preschool special needs, um, the ED units, and ESC services alignment contract. One thing we're adding to the contract this year, so you'll see that the amount is uh, it's significantly more, but we're not paying any more. What this is 
we have several one-on-one -on -one student attendants that are employed through the ESC that are here with our students. In the past, that's been a separate contract that we have paid usually two or three times a year. Um, I asked if we could build it into this contract so that it comes out every month out of our foundation money so that it's, it's just easier to budget that way. So the um, special education contract itself without the attendance, the cost of that is $641,000. And that is actually, And then the, the, the um, adding the, the attendance on is another $270,000. So like I said, you're not paying them anymore, it's just the contract, we, we're just paying it in a different way. notify them by March 1st, I believe it is, if we don't want to continue with it. Okay. Um, so Actually, yeah. it says the last day, of, yeah, last day of February, so. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm just curious. Yep. I'm always, yeah, so we have heightened alerts to, uh, to auto renew. No, mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah, we have, so we have a contract with them for the special ed units and for the speech therapy, and then we have a contract with the ESC in Sayota County for the occupational therapy, physical therapy. Okay. The Dental Consortium Agreement is another one that we approve every year. It's through Meta Solutions. It's a consortium of uh, about 20 to 25 school districts. And for this year, our um, dental premium is actually decreasing by 2% because we had really, um, the consortium as a whole had good claims and uh, us, we specifically had um, low, much lower claims. So it just happened to be a good year. So no change no for change. employees or anything? And there's actually a decrease too, more than of two percent. Okay, and the curriculum, uh, Mrs. Marquez, we have we have some raw data that we've. Uh, it's unofficial, but it's our spring 2023 data, and she's got some of that that we'd like to share with you. Uh, we shared this with our staff the last mm -hmm. in-service day uh, in the morning. That was our first meeting to take a look at that, and uh, we we prayed some of the folks that will show improvement in front of peers, so. Okay, I, mean, I don't know if you want me to uh, read through this, but so uh, we presented this to our staff on our um, last final day in our work day. Um, these are, like I said, this is kind of unofficial. I know that it has been crunched kind of manually type of thing. Um, so we were 47% in the ELA in third grade. Now, what we did, Mr. Huber and I, with Patrick, we, if you look at this, I went ahead and put all the data from the last, you know, obviously we don't have 2020 because of COVID, but what we did is we kind of looked diagonally and said, well, last year in third grade they were 42, but this year they're 53, so that's great. That's, that's yeah. plus plus. <coughs> so that, that's what the green means. We went from 50% in grade four in ELA to 67 in grade five, so, um, and so on and so forth. Um, this is pretty, we're like super excited about this 72% in um, seventh grade ELA. I mean, and you know, sixth grade got 56. Uh, you know, we, we fell a little bit there. And then, um, okay, the 41% might not seem super impressive in ELA 10, although we were pretty happy with that, but we probably had, I didn't count them, I need to do that. We probably had maybe 45, 50 kids, maybe even more that met the graduation requirement. So rem remember when Lorna told you they may not be in this number, but they met the requirement. Um, so Maddie and Kate were actually pretty excited about that. Um, if we look at math, third grade was 46%. Um, Real quick, Missy, when we look at the percentage, what is this? Is this meets requirements? Is it that is what, proficient what, what, or higher. Proficient or higher, thank you. So that 80% is what you want, which is really difficult to achieve, but we wanted to see growth. I mean, that, yeah, and I think we did start. overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in third grade, um, last year they were 42% in 
wait, I didn't read down, did I? I'm gonna repeat I myself. Off. Sorry. Um, but look from math, we went from that 29 to 62%. That's where we had those two perfect scores also. Um, 50 to 39 in fifth. Fifth grade, I, I'm, I was worried about them, but I think they're gonna be okay. <laughs> and then from fifth grade to sixth grade, 48 to 43. 42 to 57, once again in seventh grade, we saw a lot of growth there. Um, not as much in eighth, but remember, you have kids that are taking algebra. So that percentage is a little skewed, if that makes sense. 85% of the eighth graders passed the Algebra 1 test. Mm -hmm. We are at 23%, I'm sorry, I can't see. I need to get a vision screening at the primary. <laughs> um, <laughs> Geometry, 15%. Uh, Jenny Silk in fifth grade science hit it pretty hard. She almost got to 80%, which we were thrilled with, so she was at 78. Eighth grade science, 50. History, 54. Uh, Dakota, the one that's here every day, yeah. 72%. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, you're, you're so and 47 in biology. Um, the other little cheat sheet we have um, we do have some comparisons um, in Ross and Pike, which we totally, sorry, I'm not, well, I think you get the, I think you know that study Valley though. Um, we like to look at, you know, how we compare. So um, in third grade, do I have my grade right there? Yeah, 47%, um, 46 in math. ELA was 53, so we were a little off the mark with Eastern. But in fourth grade math, we were 62%, uh, 67 there in fifth grade ELA, 39 in fifth math, highest in the county in science, fifth grade science. If you look at grade six through eight, we were the highest in sixth grade ELA. We were the highest in sixth grade math. We were the highest in seventh grade ELA. We were the highest in seventh grade math. We were almost there in eighth grade ELA, except for Eastern. Um, math 25%, eighth grade science 50. So that's kind of where we hang there. So we were um, pretty proud of the junior high, sixth grade and seventh grade. They were very hard. They're probably a year ahead in that explicit instruction PD, so they really focused on that. They worked a lot with their um, data on benchmark assessments, the practice test. Um, what am I forgetting, Marcos? Anything else? No, you hit it. <laughs> walkthroughs. You did walkthroughs. Yeah, you know, with the yeah. explicit instruction. Yeah. So, um, high school. So we were 11, let me pull this up for you so you know what I'm talking about. Algebra one. Make this a little smaller so you can see it. Uh, that's a little too small. Sorry. Do the other Pike County, Pike County schools hold off algebra until high school? Is that why their numbers are higher? It's kind of mixed. Um, we, we've talked about that too, Trevor. Uh, you know, I mean, that's an area where we feel like, obviously, if we did that, our test scores would be higher. But yeah, I mean, is that the best project? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any idea what uh, percentage of Algebra One students are eighth grade versus high schoolers? Is it about half and half, or is it? Uh, are they mostly eighth graders? The two classes in eighth grade. Two classes in the junior high. Eighth grade algebra, I believe it was 40, uh, 40 kids. 40 kids. It's 48 graders. So. Yeah. 48 graders, okay. Yeah. So. so mostly high schools. Yeah, 38. Yeah. So maybe 38 about third. graduation requirement scores. So not just. Mm -hmm. Now, something I will tell you, even if you look at those percentages, um, I just by looking, and I started to calculate it, but it's a lot of calculation, I felt like I'm hoping our performance index went up. Because like, I think I counted 31, 32 kids like in seventh grade ELA that were at advanced, which that's, that's a lot for us. And even in the other areas, I felt like kids 
like moved up, if that makes sense, or we had more of those upper levels. So we'll see how that, that data is just not available yet. I check it probably six times a day. <laughs> <laughs> check it before I leave home, and then I check it when I get to work, and then I check it again, and then I check it when I get home. So um, I'm guessing probably in the next week or so we'll have you know better data. Um, we looked at the um, K3 literacy. If we looked and we checked all of it, um, Kim went through and we tracked to make sure our data was correct. The third grade scores haven't pushed in yet, but by my calculation, I, I'm hoping we go from a one star to a two star, which obviously we want to be a three star, but there aren't many districts around here that are a three star. So if we see growth, I'll be, you know, thrilled. And I think we will, or we, the way I calculate, we'll see how good my math is. Um, because they do a percentage and all that. Any questions? So that's that's where all, you know, they break it down into the components different because they'll take that performance index and break it down into the gifted indicator and all of those different things. So. Okay. Yes, better. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Marquez. Mm -hmm. We we shared what she shared with you. We shared what we shared with all our teachers district wide in the auditorium. And we made sure, like the, the green sections that you saw, uh, we had those teachers that were involved with that stand and their, their peers uh, recognized them. So uh, we, we felt like that was the best way to reinforce where we want to start was with improvement. And obviously that our goal next year, we said, was uh, to have more frequent green areas. Uh, you know, each group of kids, uh, our, I know our, our principals and through our leadership team are going to be encouraging looking at, at the individual student and, and trying to make the gains with the individual student. So uh, that's where we're starting. And, uh, the principals are gonna be challenged to make sure they, uh, their, their top priority is to protect the instructional time of students and try to, to uh, dismiss any interruptions that we might have. And so we're, we're going to encourage <laughs> attendance and try to reinforce that. And then, you know, then we've got them in the classrooms now, teachers, it's your, your instructional time. So. Uh, we'll try to do that, uh, and that'll be our goal <coughs> in trying to improve uh, our achievement. So, but I do appreciate Mrs. Marquez and yeah, the process absolutely. that we've got in place. Uh, having that process in place with the changes that we're going to face with our staff, uh, it's good to have that process in place so uh, people can step into that and try to continue to improve that process. So, thank you again. Um, we also had. Uh, Oh, our policy and procedure. Right, I just want, we wanted to update you on our um, NEOLA policy manual. We have um, a first draft. So I have um, created user IDs for Mr. Rowe and Mr. Rainey um, to kind of go through our first draft and see what comments they have. And um, I'm hoping, you know, we would like to have that policy manual approved before the beginning of school. Um, one of the things I had told Mr. Rowe in an email, uh, Mr. Rainey, that I haven't told you yet, but if um, I've asked you to look at the 5,000s, which is, the, they're grouped together. You have one set of policies for your finance, you have one for students, one for professional staff, one for classified staff. Um, the 5,000s are the student policies. So I thought if, if we could look at those first, and then see if there are any changes you want to make so that we can get the student handbooks, you know, to print text to be printed. So 5,000 is the priority. Yes, 5,000. <laughs> yes. um, so we can do that. But um, it was a good process, I think. I think we all yeah. learned a lot. Um, I found it fascinating when we did it. I mean, yeah. the day that I sat in. I can't imagine doing it differently than yeah. having an expert here. Oh, and that just, it was it, perfect because, yeah, Tom Durbin, he is a former he did, superintendent. He did a great job. And he'll, you know, he, he didn't tell us what to do. You know, he didn't tell us what to pick. But he, he, was, was, helpful. he was, yeah, he could offer us real world experience. And, and it, it was a really good process. So. All right. And uh, we have a facility use request. Right, we do. We have um, one for the Pike County Community Fund. Yeah, they're wanting to use the downtown fees. Uh, waiver fees. They're asking uh, for the uh, downtown facility, the parking lot, and I think the only thing they need, they wanted access to water. Uh, they're going to have a series, a group of food trucks down there, and, 
and try to put forth a fundraiser or put one on. Uh, in July, right? I yeah, July, July 12th. Yeah. Yes, yeah, July 12th. So uh, that's a, a copy of it there. So when somebody requests water like that, do we just eat the water costs or do we charge them a little bit for that? Um, that's why they're asking for a waiver of the. Of the, even the water costs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's probably a negative one, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, we have the May 2023 financial statements that I emailed to you. And we had a few donations for the month of May. Um, we had a couple for the Spanish Club. That was for the language fair um, from. Hellbilly Tattoo we had $100 and Long and Auto Sales donated $50. And then we had multiple donations um, in memory of Tom Knoll. Yeah. And so that was $4,065.35. That goes to the art to the art club, to the art program. So that was really great. And um, Mrs. Smith um, and her class, her students, they sent thank you cards to all those who donated. Be it for the consent agenda, so we would just need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. <laughs> he got, he got. Mr. Hobbs. Yes. Mr. Ramey. Yes. Mr. Rowe. Yes. Mrs. Zoyer. Yes. Okay. Just need a motion. Yeah, uh, we want to, we need a motion for executive session to consider the employment of public, uh, public employee or official. Mr. Hoff? Yes. Mr. Rainey? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. 